The term foodie can some as a tip. Welcome back again to The Breakdown, brought to you by Coors Light. We are again in South Minneapolis, Southside Studio. You're joining us on a dreary Minneapolis Thursday afternoon. Tory Hunter retirement speech today. Got a lot to get to in episode number 15. But first... I like it. I like that. Cole, I know you like that. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been made aware of this song before? Yes, I have. Okay. A little mace. Yeah, not bad. And uh, welcome back, Cole. We don't have Zach Bennett in the studio today. We did bring back Tom Schreier against our better judgment. Yeah, no, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so Cole and Tom kind of getting acquainted here. But Cole, lots going on outside of your bubble. I don't say that disparagingly, but... You spent two weeks in Africa, got a lot accomplished. We were checking out your pictures, and just give us an overview of how that all went. Uh, it went very well. Some big things happened. I proposed to my girlfriend while we were there. I was going to so. say, yeah, while you were gone, a big-time athlete got engaged, and people were going crazy about it. <laughs> and now everyone's going to think I'm talking about Derek Jeter, but no, you. you. Wait, he got he got engaged? He's engaged, too, actually. He, to uh, who? Hannah Davis. Who's that? The gal that does the direct TV commercials. She's the genie. And was on Sports Illustrated. Oh, th- oh, that's her? Yeah. yeah. Well, there we go. Good for yeah. him. And, but anyway, he did it in kind of a backhanded fashion. He com- he confirmed it on his own website in a post about his like 100-pound dog and how he's like, oh, my fiancé gave it to me. And everybody's like, ah, he's got a fiancé. Oh, wow. That, yeah. It's kind of a weird backhanded way for him to confirm it. Yeah, definitely. Meanwhile, so you got a lot of, a lot of things accomplished and pretty awesome pictures. Yeah, and so we had a wonderful trip, and then obviously it's not only a kind of a once a lifetime trip just because of the locations that we were at and stuff like that, but then also it's going to be hopefully a once in a lifetime one for both of us. Right on, and yeah, so it was, just, it was really special and fun and all of that stuff. What was the number one thing you experienced from a you know maybe something you didn't ex- expect standpoint? Um, there were a couple things. Well, whenever you go on any kind of safari, you never know what you're going to see. You never know if you're going to be there for two weeks and not really see anything, or if you're going to see a ton of stuff. Luckily for us, we saw a ton of stuff. We saw, um, we got there. Well, first of all, we saw two male giraffes fighting. Oh man, that'd be amazing. (laughs) Yeah, that was pretty cool. I've never seen anything like that. uh, Uh, Okay. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, but how does that work? Like, I mean, do they lift up their front and back legs and no, crush so each other with it? Or? W- one of my pictures that you were flipping through, and I, I didn't get the chance to kind of interject some real quick on it, is was actually of them fighting. Oh, I didn't. Okay, I wasn't and they, they kind of they whip their heads around and try and hit each <laughs> other with the horns. Yeah, it's 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 really funny because you know it, their heads when they're whipping it around, it looks like it's made out of rubber, and it's kind of surprising for how big <laughs> those necks are. And then all of a sudden, you hear like a boom, like a, this big thwap noise when the head hits the body or their neck, and it's it's really violent, actually. So, so every giraffe is in the concussion protocol, basically. Yeah, well, th- they've, they've got those big horns up top, mm-hmm. and yeah, they're built for it, so they're good to go. So does the loser, like, tumble to the ground, or do they just, like, nope? It's over. Major, uh, major decision. We're done. Sometimes they fight to the death. Whoa. Um, but, you know, in this one, one of the dra- giraffes tried to walk away, and the other one was like, no, nah, we're not done with this, and kind of like this ain't stopped over. them, and, and then they both went at it real slowly. This wasn't like this big epic battle. You know, it was kind of slow. I mean, we were watching them for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and, you know, they'd be kind of standing there, sizing each other up, and then one of them would back up like a half step and whip the head around, and... So was it a t- like territorial thing? Because you were talking about how the animals there are just territorial. There's you know hippos and there's lions, you know, with their prides and all that stuff. And I mean, I I don't know which this one was about. It was probably something territorial. I, there weren't any females around, so I don't know if it was over them, you know, or if it was just the two of them fighting just to fight. I mean, I, I have I have no idea, but there was something going on. 
And weather was good, food was good, everything that you, yeah, you know, food that was, was food was unreal good. And then uh, a couple of the other cool things that we saw, like um, we got to a kill probably about ten minutes after the takedown, and so that was really cool. And we watched it kind of from start to finish of them just starting to open it up, eat oh, everything, man. and then uh, when we left, the the male was just kind of had got done eating females had already eaten and so we got to see that start to finish and we saw um some baby jaguars up in the tree with a kill that their mom had just killed then we saw another uh jaguar that had grabbed a baby warthog and was crunching on that thing up in the tree and you can hear all the bones popping oh man and then some hyenas were down below trying to figure out how to get up there to get it from them. And, you know, as he was dropping little things, they were eating it. So I, there was a number of really cool things. So basically like a real life Lion, lion King, though. Like, oh, yeah. Like to, almost to a T. Yeah. And so that, that's what was so fun is that we saw a number of different animals in cool situations. And then when we were in the Masamara, white rhinos aren't indigenous to that area, but they brought them there to try and bring some of them back. And... uh <clears throat> these rhinos are under 24 hour guard by 30 guards. Wow. And so we took them up there and these, these rhinos are a little bit used to people and the white rhinos are a little bit more, have a little bit more easygoing temper than the black ones. And so we were actually standing probably 30 feet from these white rhinos and it was really cool and a little bit unnerving at the same <laughs> time. But yeah, so those are just some of the things I saw. So, so you said you missed a kill by about 10 minutes. Were you hoping you had seen it or do you think that would have been a little bit too jarring to watch? No, I was, I was definitely, ho- that was, the, that was the one, one of two things that we didn't see that I really wanted to see. We saw, we saw two chases. Um, both of them were, were kind of not full blown chases. One was of a cheetah. He was kind of trotting around after, um, some Impala gazelles. I, I don't remember what he was going at, going after at that point, but you know they were off in the distance. They were you know hightailing away from, him, so it wasn't a full chase there. And then mm-hmm. we saw, um, we saw probably about fifteen hyenas, probably do a three quarter chase after some warthogs. And so we saw two of those, but we didn't see any takedowns or anything. But I definitely was hoping for it. But next time, yeah, I, I can definitely understand that. So while you were gone, we were back here, kind of. Holding down the fort, did bring in Zach Bennett, who you'll meet, I think, next week. I think yep, we're going to start yep. alternating Tom and Zach maybe a little bit awesome. to get another voice going. And so we broke down the, the flip situation. And what am I missing, Tom? We What else did we break down? We had down? flip, kill, Jerry Kill retiring. Yeah, Jerry Kill retiring. Yeah, that's right. That was, that was kind of wild. And then Tory Hunter just kind of speculative and you know, talking on that. Yeah, it was kind of surprising that Tory Hunter was the least upsetting thing to happen over that three, four day stretch, Tory Hunter deciding to hang them up. Your time with the twins and Tory Hunter's with time with the twins, both the first and the last, uh, you kind of create just a timeline or a, a straight line of he was with the team, then you were with the team, and then he was with the team again. Yep. So I, I don't suspect you have any stories. You, maybe one year you guys overlapped at spring training, but I, I highly doubt that because you would have still been pretty early in your tenure with the club. But any memories of him as a player? See, see for me... You know, there were the there was robbing home runs. There was the I live for this commercial where he steals a home run from Carlos Lee, and and, and there's that that stare, that bewildered stare. Those were all great, but for me, it was the diving catch in the Metrodome. And I believe it preserved what was at the time a no hitter for Johan Santana. It didn't finish the no hitter, obviously, but it might have actually been the same day he struck out like 18 Texas Rangers, and so it was just a ridiculous play, just an iconic Tory Hunter play, and that's that's. One of the things I'll remember is just kind of how great he was at defense, specifically very early in his career. And I think that's how I'm going to remember his time as a twin. You know, this last time was great, too. He was, a, you know, uh, if you ask a lot of the players, a big-time leader for this team that, that drastically overachieved. But I'll remember him as a young player and how great he was back then. Yeah, I, I remember that it was in Milwaukee, right, where he robbed Barry Bonds. Okay, that's the iconic play. I can't believe I missed that. Yeah. That's, that's the I mean... That's the iconic Tory Hunter play, robbing Barry Bonds in the Australian. Oh, definitely, yeah. And th- those are kind of the things that that I remember too, because I, I never I never played with him, so I don't have any any personal stories now, about he's, him. He's about ten years older than you are, so you probably watched him more as a a fan. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember um, call what I probably would have been in high school when he was kind of getting into his when he rounded prime. into form was like two thousand one or two. 
So you probably would have been like a junior. Yeah, exactly. Like so, you know, th those are kind of the times that, that I remember him o outside that, I, you know, him playing me, watching him on TV are kind of the only memories I have just like you two guys. I don't, I don't really have any playing with him just cause it never happened. And yeah. And I think somebody was asking me like how the twins will replace that leadership. Do you think what he did from a leader standpoint can continue without him there? That's a good question. Um, because it's, if, it's, if he brought guys out of their shells, whether it's Trevor Plouffe, depending on if Plouffe's on the team next year, Brian Dozier, Aaron Hicks, if, if those guys can continue who they were becoming or they're you know, coming out of their cocoon, so to speak, then, yeah, there is some lasting effect. Or does Terry Ryan have to kind of think, mm, this is still a pretty young team. I still might need to have one more guy like that. I, I think he needs to go and get one more guy like that because I think Torrey did an unreal job of – setting that team on the proper path, but I think it needs a little bit more maturation because if you've got players like Brian Dozier, I think he's definitely going to be a great leader down the road, but he's still, he's still fairly young where Dozier's on his what fourth year in the big leagues or, or something like yeah, that. Parts of probably. Yeah. And Tori was on his what 18th. I mean, I, I, I think he was the only player in baseball to start 18 straight opening days. Yeah. Or like that was a, I don't know if it was a current record or if it was a record for a recent time frame, but... Yeah, so, so there's a big difference between those two, and I, I think the team's on a, on a good path. It, it just it needs to continue for one, maybe two more seasons. So is A.J. Pruszynski that guy? No way. No way? <laughs> I mean, I just don't see it. So, okay. J just, just what I've, I've heard of him, that he can be... An interesting character, Abrasive would be yeah, what I would in use. in the clubhouse, and I I don't think I don't think that mentality is going to work well with that team, and and him and Tori have such different personalities and mentalities that he could be, but I think he'd have to act a little differently than he normally does. Yeah, I think Surly Abrasive would sponsor him. Yes, <laughs> I would agree with that. Any Tori Hunter thoughts from you, Tom? You covered him. Yeah, well, I was probably there more today. than I, probably more than I did this season, and you were at the the going away press conference today. What was the what was the vibe like in the room in the Sid Hartman? It, it was room? funny. First of all, Sid thanked him for being good to the media, which actually, among Sid moments, was actually pretty touching, pretty and cordial. Like, yeah, yeah, heartfelt, but. Uh, um, no, I think, you know, he, the, the thing that I took away from it is he, he had some scripture saying like iron strengthen the iron, something like that in the Proverbs. And he emphasized, you know, kind of the relationships and that's what kept him going kind of later in his career. Cause he admitted like the last two years, he's thought about retiring. No, he, the one thing he did say too was he hit that first career home run and the catcher was Brad Osmus. Yes, and then Brad yep. Osmus started managing and Tori's like, Hmm, I'm getting old. Might be time. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's cool. I mean, I, you know, some people are going to say, well, I think too many people. Cause he literally went down a list of, you know, he had something in front of him of all these guys. He had, a, he, had he a said thing. he wasn't going to call Mike Berardino a prick either. That was funny. And, and yeah, the funny, thing funny. too, is that's a good example of something that started off really wrong. And Mike Berardino, who a guy I look up to as a writer and a, a really good guy, people, so nice when you don't see that, but yeah. Um, Look, he can be difficult to work with at times, and Tori Hunter made that work. I mean, they both did, and I think that's a good mm -hmm. story of, hey, look, the press conference started off with this memorable, you know, you're a prick, and ended with, you know, some. Did, he asked a hard question. He said, did you think with the Royals, what was going through your head when the Royals won the World Series, and you could have been part of that? Tory Hunter never won the World Series. What did Tory say? I didn't hear that. I mean, basically, his response was it was more than that. You know, he, he talked about God's plan, obviously, and just how he, um, you know, he felt he was in the right place. He, he retired with the team he started with, and he, he could influence Hicks, Bucks, and all those guys. Who knows? Your guy, J.R. Graham, might have broken his forearm. Oh, uh, hey. Because Alex Rios. That's know? right. So it, it came down to Tory Hunter or Alex Rios for the Royals, yep. if I'm not mistaken. Which, in that case, I don't know why they didn't pick Nori Aoki of all players, sure, the guy sure. that was departing. But, no, it, it it's amazing that he chose Minnesota to come back to. And I, for such an inferiority complex that Minnesota people, Minnesota fans have, a lot of guys do decide to come home at the end of their careers. And I think that you know, it's kind of that Care 11 local angle thing. But sure. at the same time, I think the fans eat that up. Yeah, definitely. And, I mean... Minnesota is such a hometown, hometown, homey. If, if, yeah, you know, homey feel like a, <laughs> if you can back oh, those up. Speaking of the guy who played for his yeah. hometown yeah. crew, and so I, I think I think they love that story of of Tory starting here and coming back here to finish up his career. It, it's just it, it's good press. No it's regrets good press for him around. either. I don't think. Well, I would hope not with the career that he's had. My God, I mean, 
well, money. I mean, yeah, where, know, where where could you awards, go wrong? But, and how many people come out of baseball being like, look, I have options. I could go on TV. I could go, you know, the Twins probably will offer him, you know, a coaching position. He, I'm sure the Tigers and the Angels would too. I right. Mean, that's the other thing. Torrey Hunter, it, it was funny. I think it was Brian Murphy of the Pioneer Press asked what he'd be, you know, what he would remember if when he's the old man on the rocking chair and he goes, you know, I'm not old yet. I'm going to be playing basketball until I'm 70. I mean, the fact <laughs> that he's just this kind of freak athlete, but also killer personality, really valued these relationships he developed and has all these options. I mean, I think I, I think a lot of people, especially someone like Tory Hunter, who says I'm a baseball guy. He was what 17 when he first kind of you know was in the Twins uniform. Well, 93 drafts, 75 birthday. Yeah, eight, 17 or 18. Yeah, he said I think I think he said he took the field and it was like three days until his 18th birthday. For a guy who's a baseball guy through and through, who Charlie Walters wisely asked, you know what you know what would he be doing if you weren't doing baseball? And he's like, I don't know. He has so many other things he can do. I mean, I, I think that's a hard balance to strike. And it, you, we learn it in every sport. When a player's career ends, it's really difficult kind of to transition. He's going to do it beautifully. What, what you do you think he's going to do, Cole? I think I think he's probably just going to, or what I think he should do as someone who kind of experienced that a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And Tori and I had polar opposites of careers. Um, but it, it, you need to take some time off and just, figure out what you want to do whether and i don't know whether that's a year two years five years i know he's got he's got kids so I feel, yeah, he's got a son playing football at notre dame i think the the human ball player tendency would be to dive back into something just because of the routine that you get into like you you said you know you got to break that routine of baseball exactly. every single day for me and, and tell me if i'm crazy I, I mentioned this to the guys last week but i'd like to get your perspective to be uniformed personnel the year after you retire would be awfully hard for a me, me, not not even you know a professional athlete. So you're going to have a unique perspective here, but it, it would be so hard to be that close to the game but not be playing that quickly after. And I think that's why it might be, make more sense if he's going to take a coaching job to do it a couple years later. I I would be absolutely shocked if he was able to do that Could, because for me, I still have a hard time going to a Twins game. And watching, you know, I, I still get jealous sometimes of the guys that that, mm -hmm. that are on the field because I know that I'm still physically able to do that. Right. And so I, I would be absolutely shocked if, if he was able to kind of step aside from that. And, you know, I think for me, it was more just kind of the competition aspect. And he's been in, in competing at the big league level for longer than my whole career was. So if he would, would be able to kind of step aside from that and all of a sudden be a coach, I mean, I, I would be so surprised because I think it's so unbelievably difficult to do. And do you think Do you think there's some, some how do I put this? For you, it's because you're a little bit younger too, though? Uh, it, it, it's possible, but I, Tori can obviously still play in the big leagues. Yeah. You know it, what it I mean? Might, it might not be as a starter, and it might not be... You know, he might not hit 20 home runs next year if he had decided to come back. Yeah, he, he's, he's not the all-star that he used to be, right. but he's still a bona fide player. Capable. Yeah, and, you know, where me, it was, it was kind of the same thing. You know, I mean, like, I, well, I was never an all-star or was ever going to be, but, you know, I'm still physically able, and I, I could if, if I chose to get back going. I'm sure I could get it with some team and, and possibly get back up. And so like, it's it's not that I can't do it. I, mm -hmm. I chose not to. And it's kind of the same thing for him. I, I, th I think that makes it even more difficult than when you have a career ending injury and it's, and it's one of those situations where you're like, I, I can't do this anymore. And so I, I think that's why it's going to be even harder for him for the foreseeable future. Okay. So let's go down the line. Aaron, if you want to jump in too, you can. In five years, Tory Hunter will be doing blank. Oh man! If I if I had to guess here, broadcasting first within those five years because I think actually players are sometimes better when they're closer to the game. Yeah. Because they know they're like you know Chris Archer was great because he goes I face these guys. You know, there's also a big relationships aspect where if Tory Hunter is assigned a Sunday game and he shows up on Friday night at Target Field, he can talk with some of those players beforehand. Yeah. He's still got those relationships to the point where. Brian Dozier might tell him something he's noticed from a pitcher, and yeah. boom, you've got a great TV nugget right there. Yeah, so I think he does that for a few years, and I think, you know, and this is maybe wishful thinking, but he comes back to the Twins as like an outfield coach or something where he can influence the players, not mm -hmm. as a player himself, but with his personality, and I'm sure there's going to be 
part of him that's like, did you carry on my legacy? Are you still talking about me? Are you still doing dance parties? Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Not in an egotistical way, just like, look, he offered a lot to the team. Hopefully it carries on through those five years. But that's my guess, broadcaster and then coach. What do you got, Cole? I, I, I think he might take a season off, season or two off, and mm -hmm. kind of just hang out with his family because he's been away from them for so long. You know, right. it, it's, it's hard to actually be a family man when you're playing a Major League Baseball season. So I think he might just take a little time off. And during that, I, I could really see him doing some broadcasting, whether it's for ESPN, NBC. I, I would be absolutely shocked if he was on a small market. Fox Sports One, maybe. Yeah, yes, yeah, something Pete like that. Pete Rose was a spot, maybe. Yeah. Oh God, oh, Pete Rose was. Pro Pete Rose. I don't know if you saw any of the World Series. He was really bad. Well, he he just, yeah. I mean, he just has. <laughs> he, he just terrible on there. He I doesn't. Mean, he does, yeah, he doesn't have a, uh, an eye for the moment, and, and so like. Well, and he doesn't take direction with what the commentator is trying to <laughs> push the conversation. Yeah, you know, the one I was watching, I don't even remember what was going on, but. And I don't even remember who... Well, who, Kevin Burkhardt is a saint for working with him. Yeah, but he's just sitting there, and all of a sudden, Pete Rose just goes off on his tangent, talking to Frank Thomas, like, hey, Frank, what, what about this? And it's just like, shut up, bro. Like, you know, go with the flow of the conversation. Well, he's so antiquated his talking, you know, his, his feelings about concussions, and yeah, Josh Donaldson's really got to force his way into the game. You know, they, I wouldn't let them take me out like, dude, the guy was being checked for a concussion or whatever. You know, you just you can't stay in the game. <laughs> in this day and age, that's just kind of taboo. He also left the World Series to go like sign autographs, right? In Vegas. I don't know if that was a real. He he wasn't covering the World Series anymore, and they said he had a previous engagement. Maybe they're like, and some people Pete, were like, Pete. Oh, maybe he was signing <laughs> autographs in Pensacola or something. something no, like no, that. it's in Vegas. I think he had. Oh, like, was it legitimate? Yeah. Okay, I heard heard some jokes. Well, he he's got he's got a store there, or yep. he's like a partner in one. So I, we were oh God when I was in Vegas a long time ago. Uh, we were actually walking by, and and it said something like. Buy two things, get Pete Rose's autograph or something yeah. like that. <laughs> I was no, like, there's like, a 30 for 30 on it. He literally just sits there all day and signs autographs. Oh, that's crazy. Well, let's do this. Let's pause. We'll come back. We're going to talk about a pitcher's attributes and how much he's in control of changing them. So join us for the second segment on The Breakdown brought to you by Coors Light. Hey everybody, my name is Joan Vorderbruggen and I want you to tune into my new weekly podcast, Joan of Art, on the Alive and Social Network. Each week on Joan of Art, we will interview some of the most talented artists from across the Twin Cities. I'm talking painters, costume designers, filmmakers, poets, there's going to be something for everybody. You won't believe some of the things people are making. <laughs> 598,000 light brights. Takuma created the world's largest light bright. Right. So I know that there's a piece that you're working on. It's called How to Have Fun in a Civil War. A friend of mine is like, you're bringing civil war to the state fair. <laughs> you can find the Joan of Art podcast at www.aliveandsocial.com or look on Facebook for Joan of Art podcast. Tune in weekly to Joan of Art as we investigate and celebrate people who make art. Okay, Story North celebrates the storytelling arts, hosted by author and University of Minnesota creative writing professor Kim Todd, public radio producer and host of the Twin Cities' biggest and best book club, Books and Bars, Jeff Common, and blogger and journalist Jay Stevens. Story North will mull, wrestle, and have fun with any art form containing narrative, including novels, film, television, comics, games, and theater, and with special emphasis on the Twin Cities' vibrant literary community. I appeared on that show last week, talked a little bit about Moneyball, a little bit about how baseball writing has evolved over the last many, many years, actually. And so it was fun. Check that out on the Alive and Social Network, where it's podcastable. I think they're on iTunes, too. Is that that's accurate? Okay, so check us out for Story North, but also, importantly, check out the breakdown on there. We'd love to have more subscribers, more listeners, and all that. I... Didn't I, I honestly didn't spend as much time preparing today as I would have liked, and I'm going to explain. I, I was on my way to the studio, and I, I'm, I'm perpetually checking myself because I think I've forgotten something. I, I tap my pockets for the phone, for the wallet, and since we've moved to kind of a nicer neighborhood where I can park inside my own garage, I usually keep my wallet in the console and my laptop in my trunk. And 
I, I got to the end of my street and I thought, I didn't take my laptop bag out of the car. It's still in the trunk. I'm just worried. Like, I don't want to drive all the way to town and find out I got to go all the way back to get it and come back for the show. So I stop, I check, laptop bag is there. I'm an idiot. Fine. I got a couple errands to run. I stop at the UPS store and I flip open the console. No wallet. <laughs> so of course, of course. I end up having to drive all the way back home oh anyway. God. And I got here just in time for the show. But anyway, long story, long diatribe. But anyway, what we had been talking about two weeks ago when we were shooting the last of our drone videos, and if people haven't checked or heard about those, I guess they can't check them all yet because I don't think they're up yet. No, I, I, uh, we, I was looking we, for them. I didn't see them. We had some emails going back and forth today, and I think Arnold just finished the two of the graphics. Okay. And so I think they're getting wrapped up. So I'm guessing probably in the next week or two. So, so anybody who, who's something. just joining us for the first time, where have you been? But also, we were shooting these drone-based baseball instructionals. Cole is the star. I'm like Silent Bob, yeah. kind yeah. of <laughs> making the plays but not saying anything, which is fine. I actually, I actually really enjoyed it. I was flattered to be even asked. And we had a lot of fun with those. We filmed 10 of them. They should be coming out soon, and we'll start, uh, I'll start promoting those on, on Twitter, Facebook, and all that too. But I'm looking forward to those coming out. And when we were doing the last video, it was freezing. Like it, even it much, was colder, cold. much colder than today, quite frankly. I think oh, it was yeah. probably about 45 degrees. And, and, it, and it was windy that day, yeah, too. It was horrible. So it felt way worse. It, it was just horrible. So we were standing on the mound just trying to stay warm. And I, I had asked Cole about something to talk about for the future. And it was, it was this. Pitchers all kind of have ways they can be defined you know, you talk about a Johan Santana in his day was a strikeout pitcher. Kyle Gibson, Schlibson, if you ask, <laughs> ask Cole <me>. over here, <laughs> ground ball guy. And Cole, actually, you were a very specific type of pitcher too. And, and so I guess I wanted to ask, when you interact with other pitchers coming up, are they all aware pretty much of what kind of pitcher they are? <laughs> I think the further along the guys get in their career, they're more aware. I think when you're in the first couple of years of pro ball, um, especially the high school players are very unaware of who they are. You see this more with the college guys because obviously, you know, you're in, in college for three, four years. So you, you have time to kind of develop who you are as a player. Um, but the younger guys just have really no idea. And so even if they are or would be, a control style pitcher, they're trying to be the max effort strikeout guy. And so it usually, it usually takes a little while. You know, I felt like, I felt like, especially once I got into pro ball, you know, I had, I had a pretty good idea and I kind of always had a little bit of an idea that, you know, my, my role is going to be a control guy that I'm going to be striking out guys here and there, you know, maybe I'll have my a game where I strike out 10 guys or something like that. But on the average is probably going to be around five guys and in, in av- four or five guys in an average start. And, you know, I n- figured out real early on that when I tried to rear back and absolutely let it go to try and strike someone out, that didn't work that well because I might have got an extra mile an hour, but uh, usually went right down the middle and a hit or a home run happened. So yeah, I, I I knew real quick that I wasn't the power pitcher. Can, can stuff flatten out when you do that too? Oh, definitely. Because anytime that you're not using your normal motion and you're trying to over exaggerate something or overemphasize it, 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 it's just different. Your body doesn't react the same. So yeah, stuff definitely flattens out the same thing when you try to overthrow a curveball usually instead of putting it in the dirt where you where you want to mm-hmm. it goes right down the middle and uh you know they get a hit or something so instead of spiking it it gets just blasted yes exactly so this this is actually going to be kind of fun for me it might not be for you but it's not really that big of a <laughs> deal right. uh, you threw 100 big league innings do you have even the slightest guess what your ground ball percentage was so what? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me about strikeouts, and I was going. Oh, no, no. I was going to laugh that oh, you no, actually no. I do know it because I've been asked that three times. Um, um, so do you do you know what your ground ball rate was? I'm trying to remember. It's a semi. It, it, it's on the verge of being a very round number, and I'll give you a hint. the 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 MLB average is about forty five percent. I'm going to go thirty five percent. Twenty nine point nine. Wow. So you were you were you were a fly ball guy, and again, pitchers come in all different shapes and sizes. You. I think the kind of the the holy trinity to not be offensive to Tory Hunter and his beliefs 
is teams teams like guys who strike out a lot of people, don't walk anybody, and get a ton of grounders. I mean, those are your aces, your Jake Arrietas. Francisco Liriano, when he's rolling, is doing those things. He, he, he still kind of walks a lot of guys. But you'll look at like a Felix Hernandez when he's cruising. He'll have nine strikeouts per nine, two walks per nine, and like a 58% ground ball rate. And so it's like minimizing your mistakes. When guys hit the ball, it's on the ground. You're not going to give up big big hits. You know, extra, Very few extra base hits come from ground balls. You either roll it down the first baseline or third baseline, you might get a double. But it doesn't leave the park. It's, it's a matter of limiting damage. So fly ball guys have you know a different skill set, different level of, of maybe ability to evade those bigger innings. But I guess the one thing I wanted to ask, or, or maybe a number of things, if a pitcher is aware that he's a fly ball pitcher, is it possible to completely alter that, or is it different for every guy? Boy, um, the only way that I could see a pitcher kind of altering that, you know, fly ball to ground ball, is if all of a sudden you start learning a sinker that you didn't mm-hmm. have before, and it kind of took over instead of your forcing fastball. I mean, that, that's kind of that's kind of the only way, you know, outside of that. The re- the rest of the pitches in your repertoire, I mean, depending on what they are, if you're throwing them correctly, they're if you're, you're throwing them down, they should be ground ball, or you're kind of getting get that excuse me fly ball. So I, that's kind of the only thing. And you know, for me through my career, I did have a a two seam fastball. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. I only kind of used it in certain situations just because I I wasn't super comfortable with it especially throwing it on the glove side of the plate just because i was always way too scared that i was going to run back over the middle and then smoke. yeah and then damage time um so i only kind of threw it away to lefties into righties and you know I, I did that also because i didn't have as good a control of it as my forcing fastball so I, I i think it's possible but i think it's extremely difficult to make that adjustment were, were you aware while you were active though that you were a big time fly ball guy um, I mean, yeah, cause it I, maybe it doesn't really matter. I yeah, mean, honestly, you know, you just you pitch your game, and whatever happens, happens. I just wonder if that was something you were keen keen on while you were active. Um, it's something that I would say I wasn't super aware of. I, I knew I always gave up a lot of home runs and yeah. stuff like that, and, and that was my thing that I always had to be cognizant of and keep it in the, in the back of my head, is trying to limit guys getting on the base because I, I knew that. You know, I try to stay out of those situations where you know solo home runs are really going to hurt you, but the right. two three run blasts are the ones you really got you got to watch out for. Um, so there's that, and it was also kind of one of those things. I I felt at times I could manufacture a ground ball if I needed one, mm-hmm. but I was more just worried about the guy hitting the ball uncomfortably, so it was hit softly or with as much loft on it to to one of my guys behind the field because. That was, ooh, what do we got going on there? Um, that, not, that was, not being in control of the situation. <laughs> that, was, uh, the, that was one of my things, that, is that I, I always wanted the hitters to hit the ball because I want to get out of the Indians as quick as possible. And So, yeah, if they hit it in the air, great. If they hit it on the ground, so be it. Is your sense, though, um, that, that players are aware of what, what kind of pitcher they are in, in, in at least some form or fashion? Because, okay, so when I asked Glenn Perkins about he's basically, he basically, he's like, you know, even the guys that really study the statistics don't put as much stock into them as you'd think because you still have to pitch your game, you still have to pitch to your exactly. reports and stuff. And so, so a lot of them view the numbers as just kind of where things lie when you're done. And so like you you you, may, you might understand if you're Kyle Gibson that your money is made on ground balls, but it's not it's not going to dictate everything you do. No, and, and it can't because there's so many situations and circumstances that are going to present themselves in the game where a fly ball might be more beneficial than a ground ball and this, this and that. And so, you know, it, it's, it's tough to try and pitch a hundred percent to that action, but you know, you're kind of aware of those situations and you try to make those happen. And you, you also try to know your game and how your game is going to play effectively into that situation. Now, now, one thing I wanted to ask you about too, about the evolution of a pitcher is is this: when you're in the minors too, like you had a couple stops where you struck out a lot of guys, mm-hmm. and and part of that is is just um, you know you are facing some guys who aren't going to continue up the ladder in lockstep with you. Saw so with Liam Hendricks, 
who I think you could say you guys were somewhat similar. I think he was a fly ball guy too. Yeah, I, I, I would say the majority of our pitches were probably were, were fairly similar. He threw he threw just a little bit harder than me at, at times, mm-hmm. and but but outside that we were, yeah, we were we were fairly similar pitchers. I would say. So you start figuring out who you are maybe early in pro ball. How much can that be affected by? seasons where you you know you really do well in the minors and then kind of each way up the ladder it drops off a little bit you know you strike out six six point one batters per nine in the big leagues uh, you know a little bit beneath the average but not not absurdly amount beneath that but at times there's eight or nine in the minors do you still kind of have an idea of who you are even if the numbers might indicate that it could come down in the future as you go up the ladder i i always expected things to get worse the more the further I progressed. I think, most, I think most players do, though, you know, assuming... Oh, actually, you know, now I think about it, you are also a physically mature mm-hmm. adult player. You probably didn't have as much growing as maybe a, a, a high school draft pick, too. And that's an interesting point that I hadn't thought about until this exact second, is the evolution of some guys realizing, maybe I'm not going to get any better, but my execution will be better, whereas the younger guys get better as they physically develop. Is that it? Maybe I'm... I'm just spitballing here as no, it comes to me. No, you're definitely right, and and that's kind of what my whole game was by the time I got to pro ball because you know I signed when I was 21, 22, whatever it was, and I'm not growing anymore. You know, I might be able to get a little bit stronger here and there in in the off seasons, but it's kind of tough because you have such a limited amount of time. So you really need to get better at getting better action on your pitches. Um, executing them more efficiently and more effectively. And so those are kind of the only things that, that you can really control if you know that your velocity isn't going to be increasing year to year just because your your body's physically maturing. And, yeah. I just wanted to ask about the mental side of things just because I found that interesting, how mental baseball is and how much players talk about that and are conscious of that. Is it? Do you have to convince yourself at some point that you have major league stuff? Because obviously the odds are with the pitcher if they're executing. I mean, how much is that, and how how difficult is that? It's got to be easier said than done, right? When you got, got you know guys on the corner, a major league hitter, you might not trust your stuff as much. Uh, I think if you are in any organization at, at any level, and you don't think that you're one of the best guys on the field, whether you are or not, you should probably go home because. And unless you're just ridiculously talented, like let's just say you're a Joe Maurer in the minor leagues and he's walking around like, man, I suck all the time. Well, Joe's still going to make it. He got $5 million and he's ridiculously good. He's still going to make it. But for the average guy like myself, who, you know, I I felt like I was a pretty average, maybe a a little above average guy throughout throughout my career, uh, depending on, on the level, you have to think that you're the best. And if you don't think that you're the best, then you're going to get beat. And, you know, there was a lot of times when I walked out on the mound and, you know, I knew I didn't have my stuff that day, but I still thought that I was better than everyone else. Or, you know, I didn't care who I was pitching against. I knew that on any given day, if I had my best stuff, you know, me and him were going to go head to head. You know, and and, and I, I did that a couple different times with a couple a couple of really good pitchers. And so you, you just have to have that mentality. And like I said, if you if you don't, then it, it, the odds are so much even more against you because you you have to have that that confidence and and I guess borderline arrogance just just to get by because it, it's such a brutal game with failure and everything else. That, that's what makes me laugh when people say they want a. What's the word I'm looking for? Where you're the opposite of arrogant. No, uh, humble. Like, yeah, people want to humble athletes. Like publicly, and maybe out up front, if they're humble inside, though, you have to have that motivation, that heart of a lion, so to speak, where you know that it's you against everyone else in a lot of senses, and you just have to believe that you're better. It, it, exactly, and I know we've talked about that a couple times, and it, it's kind of that that weird dynamic that that fans want, where you know that this player has to be kind of arrogant, mm-hmm. but you also want them to be humble. And it's kind of like, it's like, okay, well, well, well where do you draw the line on people, this? People are ticked. You know, Kansas City fans are ticked that Alex Gordon opted out of his contract or, or Zach Greinke with one, you know, Greinke actually had three years left on his deal. But there's an opportunity to make more money and people are like, well, he should, he should take less money. Like, why? See, I, why? Th- 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 that's one of those those situations that just cracks me up where... If I had $20 million to give someone, I said, hey, 
I'm going to give you this $20 million. Any one of those people who are making these comments, they're not going to sit there and go, <laughs> nah, you know, I, t- 10's good for me. You keep the other 10. Well, the other thing, too, is oh, I'd do it for yeah. a lot less. You're also bad at sports and work at Burger King, so of course you would take $10 <laughs> yeah. million. Dollars. No, no, no one's going to go in their employer tomorrow and say, you know what? I would choose to have less money for the same working environment. And, and he, well, we're going to have to fire Bill to keep you. Cool. Yeah. That's fine. I can flip those burgers, too. Yeah, no, it, so. it, it just—I mean, uh, that, that's obviously very rude of me to say, but I, it does frustrate me that people try to apply average, average person logic to. The, it's like it's like entertainers, you know, you don't movie makers or or, or anything. You, you don't say, "Hey, this this actor should get less money." It's like, why? It's, it's entertainment, and you need to maximize your value while while you're hot, basically. Because you, because my, my whole thing when I when I was playing this was kind of my my mantra for myself, all, also for kind of saving money when, when I was playing the big is, is I didn't know if from the day I got called up if I was going to be there for one day or if I was going to be there for another 10 years. Mm-hmm. And so that's why, you know, the the team, and this is the other thing that I think that I don't think people really take into account is that the teams really don't care about you to as long as you're playing well and they've got you under contract. I mean, I mean, the, the, you're not you're a piece of meat to to the teams, and they want the team to be as good as it can be for as cheap as possible. And so, if they can sign you to a five year contract for five dollars, mm-hmm. they're going to do it. Well, think about the hierarchy of power. There's how many millions of people that would like to be baseball players. Funnel that into twenty five guys on the roster. Funnel that into one team. That gives the team ultimate power to basically do whatever it wants to to get the best talents at the most reasonable prices and. You know, if you want to win, you you might take that next step up. And if you want to be the Dodgers, you take that next step up as in terms of payroll. But from a standpoint of just keeping a guy around because it's the right thing to do, well, there's not really a place for that in professional sports. A little more so in baseball than football, which is ruthless. But it's yeah. it's just part of understanding the economics of the situation too. One hundred percent. All right. Well, that was a, that was a nice spirited discussion, and it went a little in a direction I wasn't expecting, but I thought that was pretty good too. Let, let's do this. Let's pause. We'll come back for some listener questions and a few other things here on The Breakdown. Just when you thought it was safe to go back online, along comes this hit show. Do you want to do this? <laughs> I will do this. Okay, no, let's doing... not battle our no, I was No, oh, Bill, oh, you're, I, you're being nice. Yeah. In a world full of hit shows, this one's the real deal. I'm refusing to engage in an argument that doesn't exist. I'm not arguing. (laughs) Twin Cities hit show. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. See, this is how fights start on pedal pubs. This is exactly. (laughs) All that that red-headed anger just came up. It's all in his chest right now. The Twin Cities hit show airs live daily, 930 to 1030, on the Alive and Social Network. Oh, Shannon, welcome to my world. (laughs) Okay, we are back for the third and final segment. My favorite segment of the breakdown brought to you by Coors Light. We lean pretty heavily on listener submitted content. But before we get to that, I did want to talk a little bit more about Flip Saunders. I know that Tom that's that's near and dear to Tom's heart. Tom covered the home opener, thus far the only home game for the Timberwolves, also unfortunately the only loss. Some controversy down the stretch. Terrible. What was what was the situation around that? I, I missed that. I had left See, I have I have some neighbors that have a garage where we go drink beer and watch That's awesome. Monday Night Football. It's awesome. So I missed the end of the Timberwolves game. So you're gonna have to fill me in. Yeah. So I, you know, and I asked a few writers if they ever saw something like this. Pat Boris, and he goes, "Man, I had to really rack my brain." I mean, there was a call. And Pat, Pat is a very seasoned reporter journalist that would have seen just Times, about everything. All that, yeah. yeah. Um, basically, there I'm, I can't remember the order or the sequence, but there was a ball that they call like Wiggins tapping the ball in or whatever. You have to let it exit the rim or whatever. There was a hundred the cylinder, or whatever. Yeah, I can't remember the exact rule, but basically he's got to let it go out, so he's not assisting a ball that would already have been going in. So he has a tip in, nice play. We saw three angles. Zach Bennett actually did a good job on Twitter, like you know, pointing out all the different angles. I was like, no way they can spend 15 minutes reviewing this and say that ball didn't go in. That would have tied the game, I believe, at 103-103 late in the game. Mm-hmm. Call goes against Wiggins. Then there's 
um, a jump ball where it looked like Towns and Plumley both followed each other, and Towns gets the call. Again, I, I don't know how they didn't see you know a guy's hand on some guy's face you know mm-hmm. like something like that um there was i'm trying to remember what the original call it was like a controversy over if the ball went out of bounds or if it was the 24 second shot clock sure a lot going on but they ended up with like an inadvertent whistle which i was like you spent 15 minutes reviewing this and realized that you guys made a mistake and you guys weren't looking for an inadvertent whistle you were looking at where the ball dropped you know so where the cop out yeah, I think that's exactly what it was. And then Kevin Martin gets fouled right at the end of the game. And I know I look at this from the perspective of someone from Minnesota who, you know, spends time at practice, gets to know the guys a little bit. Sure. But, like, I don't think you can – I mean, this is this is night and day. This is – was Martin slapped at the end of the game? Was the ball out of the cylinder? I know that's a little bit of a difficult call. Mm-hmm. Was was Plumley's hand on, you know, Towns' face? And, and – um, you know, the good thing is it didn't ruin the beginning of the game because they did such a good job with the tribute. They they had all sorts of different people, you know, locally, Charlie Walters, Patrick Royce, uh, John Krasinski, all these guys who cover the team or whatever, been around Flip forever. Uh, Greg Popovich came out and talked. Uh, a lot of the former players, Milton Newton, was really um, kind of this heart-wrenching. Yeah, just, that was horrible. Well, I mean, that was he, so hard to watch. It, it was the right thing to end on because KG wasn't part of it, and I think it honestly is because... He's so emotional. He said he said he couldn't. I mean, you saw that picture, right? Yep. I mean, that that said everything. But for for if Cole's not aware, there's yeah. a picture circulating of of Kevin Garnett sitting in Flip's parking spot, just basically disconsolate. It was like the day or day out. They, day they, day no, after. no, they found d- out during practice that Flip had died. Okay, oh, so he just man. left the court and went and sat with his hoodie on. It, it's such a great picture. But. Yeah. Um, I hadn't heard that part of it. That's that's even more heart wrenching. Yeah, I was actually I was not at that practice, but I knew they had a practice at that time. But yeah, it just um, so many heartfelt things. I never hear Greg Popovich say more than three words, so it's really amazing. That yeah, unless you're that. Craig Sager, you don't get much out of him. Tom, Tom Izzo is another one. Tom Izzo had a lot to say they were, they because they're very close time. friends. So um, you realize that Flip was just a good guy. That he, you know, I mean, there's so many positive things to say about that. Tom Hanneman really nailed it, kind of emceeing the whole mm-hmm. event. And it just for someone like me who watched the Timberwolves used to go to you know a game or two with Marbury and Garnett when you yeah. know that team was around. It just I, it finally settled in that it, it happened so suddenly, and you just don't expect someone to die at age right. sixty. And, and especially having spent last year where he was, he seemed young and vital, especially for that age. Right. Um, it finally hit me that it's like flips gone, and, and that was tough. Yeah, the pregame stuff was amazing in pretty much every way, shape, or form. Tim Mahoney, friend of the network, former podcaster, has done some shows here too. Did a really nice rendition of Hallelujah, and then the player intros were just unbelievable too. It was uh, it was some reworked Kanye songs. We couldn't find it on YouTube. I was hoping we couldn't and could play a little bit of it too. But it was like power and I'm trying to remember. I know Kanye, but I can't. Yeah, it, it was hard. I'm a Kanye junkie, it. and it was just great. Anyway, so they they merged it all together. And then the players all kind of came out to like these WWE style intros with Kevin the, Garnett skipped his, but which Garnett was funny. Sk- yeah. So Garnett was so overwhelmed by the moment that he he was sitting in his chair the entire time to the intros and then at the end he skipped his and and just joined the players for the the huddle and it was just it was just this crazy moment i wish i would have saved it on my dvr so i could so i could watch it one more time but i'm sure i'm sure it'll surface someplace but it's it's just amazing and and beyond that and and cole i'm sure you haven't seen this yet they're two and one yeah two big road victories granted not against teams that are going to steamroll anybody but from behind against la which is tough place to play (laughs) right um, and then I'm trying to Portland. Port- yeah. yeah, the Portland game, they and were Denver. in cruise control for. No, I'm, I'm thinking of Denver. Denver they were in cruise Denver. control, and then uh, they did they let them back into it a little bit, but then basically they finished so. it off. And then yeah, Portland was the one that they they ended up losing. But a team that looks like it's going to be a fun roster. Aaron, I'm sure you're passionate about this too, and feel free to jump in if you wish. Uh, what were your thoughts of the first three games? I'm excited. I'm really excited. Uh, Rubio looks like he's. Fix the jump shot, maybe just it was a like little bit. Forty assists and four turnovers, or something like that. Like at a crazy assist to turnover ratio. Twenty eight so far. points in the first game. Yeah, he was yeah. he was actually really feeling up the stroke shooting wise. Good rotation on his shots and all that too. So, now, as far as the Timberwolves are concerned, and, and granted we're not a Timberwolf show, but but off to a good start. Uh, I do want to transition to uh, kind of what we close with, which is the listener submitted things here. And so Daniel Kaushagen first wants to know if Cole. Bagged a beloved lion in Africa. <laughs> b- 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 bagged? Bag. No, no, no. I know what you're th- I you think you might have heard, but bag. B-A-double-G-E-D. Oh. 
No, Double G. I, I, I most certainly did not. I, I did not need the uh, the media recourse that the dentist from around here hey, had. Hey, hey, uh, any press is good press. Well, no, 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 not in that situation. No, definitely so. not. Hopefully, you'll be able to share your pictures too, where some people will be able to see them. Maybe, uh, maybe Twitter. You'll put some of those really nice ones up. Yeah, uh, or on uh, Instagram. Yeah, Instagram. I'm thinking about maybe putting a couple. A couple uppers. Well, if you're, like if you're if you're not following Cole on Twitter already at the Cole DeVries, what's your what's your Instagram handle? Is it I think, Cole I think it's thirty nine or something? Yeah, like that? Th- Cole DeVries thirty eight. I think that's what thirty eight. Thirty nine. The heresy. I got the wrong I know, number. Right? Uh, you're out of here. I was I gonna know. real quick question. No, was, uh, we got time. Sorry, this is user submitted or whatever. Um, do you was it hard to like focus on a shot because there had to be like a lot of going on at one time and you have to have the patience to wait for the right you know frame or whatever it, it, exactly there were uh it it is cold freeze 38 just looked at it um <laughs> nice <laughs> confirmed uh, uh <clears throat> most of the time the situation that we were in uh if it was like a lion or a leopard or, or something like that you're kind of just focused on that animal but it was really difficult just sitting there totally zoomed in on them kind of waiting for them to to make a move or or do something that would create an interesting photo and then trying to capture it that quickly. And so th- that was really the difficult. And then, you know, half the time when I'm out doing these things and I'm looking through my camera all the time, because my left eye is closed so much, I open it back up and I can hardly see anything because this one's all blurry and the other one's seeing clear. Um, but, but yeah, it's, th- that's probably the most difficult is just waiting for the situation and then, and then reacting quick enough to be able to capture it and then making sure that you're, Focus is correct. You know, there's so many things that go into taking a good photo. And so, yeah, it, it, it's definitely an, an art form and, and to try and capture things quickly. Okay, guys, going to, let's go around the horn here. And Aaron, too, you can jump in if you want. If you can watch only one show for the rest of your life, sitcom, drama, comedy, whatever, what would it be? Oh, man. That's super tough. I would say... I love The Office, at least early in its. That, it's, that uh, show that, is good. That's, that's in the the consideration for me. Yeah, the other the other weird one is I would love like to have a modern Cheers. Like I've seen some old episodes and it's good. Ooh, but yep. imagine that like in a different location with like Vince Vaughn and that crowd or something. That yeah, yeah, yeah. Really Cheers, good. Cheers was great. Cole could be the bartender. The old <laughs> yeah, <pitcher. right. laughs> Mayday Malone, right here. Mayday Tommy Malone. I, I made that joke a few <laughs> times this year. That's funny. I'm trying. I'm trying to think. Aaron, Aaron you want to yeah, jump in? You got anything? Yeah. Uh, I'd probably go with the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. Keeps oh, it's up so to, good. Up to date on current events. No, we still laugh before. Week. We, I, I was. <laughs> I was talking to him about how I don't like Jimmy Fallon, Fallon, and he got really upset. Do you, Do you like the new Daily Show? Because I feel like that one. And Colbert is good now too. That's all right. I'm just a big Fallon fan. He's good. He's. Fun. Now, is this a situation where the show is going to be? progressing with episodes or is it just locked in with whatever is available right now <laughs> mm, that's a good question because i think that will drastically change my what if we lock it in aaron does your vote change what if we lock it in today uh no no that's what i'm going <laughs> with. he's just going with syndication of jimmy fallon okay you, you saw the one with towns right yeah that was yep well okay so that if we're going great. if we're just going boom locked it in i i think i might have to go with the Office or Big Bang Theory. I, I like I like both those. And they're just kind of funny shows, and you can kind of sit there and and watch them and not really pay attention. You don't have to have your brain really turned. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. I like that. So for me, if I were to set up the contenders, Arrested Development would be in the conversation. Oh, okay. The Office and Parks and Rec. Oh, I like Parks and Rec too. I'm trying to get back into community, but the number one with a bullet is Thirty Rock. Ooh, just that, because it's, it's brilliant. Funny. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, Donald Glover was a writer for that show. I love everything Donald Glover did. Including our music, our intro music mm-hmm. for this third segment. So everything that he does is great, and so it would have to be, have to be Thirty Rock. Paul Pleiss wants to know how do most minor league players survive on meager salaries that disappear during the off season and don't return until opening day? We did touch on this about a month ago. <laughs> yeah, we did. And, yeah, uh, and always... the next person to comment says, "Living at parents' house during the off season?" Question mark. Oh yeah, I mean, well that that's uh, that's still me right now, and <laughs> it, it, that's. That's really how you do it. You got to kind of rely on your signing bonus if you got one and one that was of right any well, size you, you at said all. You kind of uh, squirreled yours together, kept it together, and kind of yeah. And you know, I mean, every, every year it cost me money to play baseball, and so I, you know, that's that slowly got dwindled down throughout my career. Um, so that 
uh, luckily, my parents were in a financial situation where they were able to help me out at times with, you know, buying certain things where they would say, you know, hey, you know, go ahead and put this on our credit card, something like that. So those were the two biggest things for me, living at home and help for my parents. And then, well, I guess we're going three. Um, And then signing bonus. But for the the guys that, that don't have their parents or don't have parents that are in a financial position to help them and get the $1,000 signing bonus, I, man, I, I have absolutely no idea how they make it. And I can't tell you how many guys I saw in the clubhouse that were showing up eating a peanut butter sandwich. And they, you know, would talk about they're going home after the game and eating a peanut butter sandwich because it's the absolute cheapest thing that they can find and buy. And it's, it's just, it, it, it's too bad. It's really too bad that it's, it's at that point. I uh, I talked to a guy I covered at Santa Clara, and he said that he lived with like four or five other people, and they actually rented a van and used to take the van to like the, or they all pitched in to get a van and took it to the park. I mean, was it a lot of like community living or whatever to kind of save up money? And stuff? Yeah, and and it kind of depends on, on the same thing. It depends on your financial situation that you're in. I I know um, obviously because the Latin guys are, are usually coming from the most distressed situations monetarily, and so. You know, I can't tell you how many guys that I played with that there was maybe four or five of them in a two bedroom apartment. So, you know, they could, they were trying to spend a hundred bucks a month or 200, you know, I mean, whatever it was, rent was at that location, but just to try and get it as absolutely cheap as possible. And, you know, I, I, I never had to be in those situations, but you just kind of sit back and it's like, man, you know, there's two or three of you guys living in this itty bitty bedroom and it, it, it's just professional sports should not be like that. You should be getting at least enough money to be able to fi- live in a decent place and eat decent meals. And, and that's like about in season too. I mean, the uh, out, out of the seasons, even more crazy. And Dirk Hayhurst's first book talked about that too, where he was living with his grandma. I think she was just like nuts. Like she would yell at him and throw stuff at him and he'd go, throw his off season bullpens in this like academy that a coach had like volunteered to let him throw at and like no glamour whatsoever. So it's it's kind of amazing the difference between I think how fans view it and how it's it's actually going. Um we're gonna wrap up with this one. It's my brother Cody wanting to know how the twins will address that leadership role into next season. We did address this a little bit at the beginning of the hour, but let's wrap with this. I think I don't know. I think Tory Hunter retiring does open a spot for the Twins to sign that kind of guy in free agency if they sense that that's someone that's available, whether it's a a A.J. Przinsky, a And again, you, you kind of laughed at that earlier, and, and I, I think it's kind of funny too. But the Twins know him probably better than anybody, so if they think it could happen... You know, he, he kind of, I think, held that role for the Braves this year. Granted, the Braves were horrible. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, is is Joe Nathan that guy? Is Justin Morneau that pl- guy? Joe Nathan still playing? Well, Joe, so Joe Nathan blew his blew his arm out and had Tommy John and can come back in like June next year. But his his option was declined by the Tigers. Yeah, Justin I Morneau's guess. option was declined by the Rockies. There's there's some options if they feel they need to go down that road. You do run the risk of it becoming a Kubel Bartlett career scenario. Well, that's the exact thing. Is is all these guys that you're mentioning outside of Przinsky are all guys that are a huge risk to not really be able to do anything well, for the Morneau whole season. Place first. Like, what are you going to do? Yeah, you're going to log Jamie again. You know, if you have a bench bat, but then are you giving up on Kenny Vargas or yeah. Oswaldo Arcia? Or, or, yeah, or Sano, depending on what happens, if, if Plouffe's out of here or not. Right. So, yeah, so, yeah. I think you have to keep Plouffe for that reason and maybe trade him at the deadline if that's what it comes down to. Right. Because I think he is a good le- you know, leader, and that's just being in there when the media is in there. But um, Brian Dozier, I feel like, would be a natural leader You know, if you look internally. Otherwise, you have to... Kyle Gibson, I think, would be another one. But you have to... These look- are all, those are all quiet leaders, though. I mean, you yeah, don't really you- have anybody riling them up. I think you know, the most riling... I mean, maybe Miguel Sano just steps up and takes that role because his personality is such that... He's good enough. He's, yeah. Yeah, he's he's I, pretty loud. I could, well, I could see Eddie <laughs> Rosario, too. He's got that personality. I don't know if he's got the verbal skills to do it, but he seems to kind of have that edge now. Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't, I don't know if he speaks English well enough. Right. To. And granted, I've heard some things, too, where maybe he's not the best guy dealing with fans and stuff, too. So I, I don't know. But if it if it doesn't come from internally... It could be an interesting offseason seeing if they start chasing those types. Yeah, I, I think there definitely 
going to look for that, but mm-hmm. who's going to be available that's going to be able to step in that Yeah, role? at the end of the day, you're not going to force a, a round peg into a square hole. Nope. And speaking of that, that's it. That's a wrap for the breakdown for producer Aaron, for Tom Schreier, Cole DeVries. Welcome back, Cole. Glad to have you again. Thank you. This is Brandon Warren saying thanks for joining us for episode number 15. We'll be back with a fresh one for you very soon. <laughs>